Senator Blake holds a master's in social work from Marywood University, and he also holds an MBA from the University of Scranton. He is the only sitting member of the Commonwealth's legislature, it's 253 people, who has this degree in, in uh, social, well, social services or in social work. But he also has the combination degree. What makes him so special? Why is that a special thing? It's because he looks at a balance sheet and he looks at that balance sheet or that budget and he sees numbers and everybody else sees numbers. He knows the numbers. He has an MBA from finance from a great institution, the University of Scranton. How could he not know what the numbers are? He knows very well what the numbers are. But he also sees something else. He can see past the numbers. And what he sees are the faces of the people that those numbers affect. He sees the elderly, the vulnerable. He sees the budget cuts. He sees where money is being spent, should be spent, and is not being spent. So he's a very rare combination of a, um, a politician, if you may, who not only sees the pure objective side of what business is all about, but has that rare sensitivity to the feelings and lives of others. If he was a Republican, I would say he's not bad for a Republican. If he's a Democrat, then he's not bad from a Democrat. But the important thing is he's terrific as a rising iconic politician in national politics. And uh, Senator Blake, I hope next year you change your address to either the executive in Harrisburg or someplace in Washington, because God knows they need you. You'll notice with those last comments, I had to stop and tell Brian, no time soon. No, no time soon, I had to tell uh, our Secretary of Aging. Thank you, Doctor, uh, for that kind invitation and for only speaking for 10 minutes. I, uh, <laughs> and I obviously want to thank Rebecca for her hard work uh, that brought, brought all of you here today. You know, um, I am uh, delighted and honored to be here to participate in the University and uh, University of Scranton and TCMC's annual conference on aging. I'm, particularly grateful uh, to join such distinguished collection of individuals who are experts in the field of aging and elder care, in particular Pennsylvania's own Secretary of Aging, the Honorable Brian Duke, who is an alumni of this fine university, and of course, uh, Dr. Linda Freed, who I've just had a chance to meet, uh, the Dean and uh, De La Mar Professor of Public Health at the uh, Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University in New York. We are grateful to have you, very honored uh, that you're gracious with your presence, Doctor, so thank you. I also want to express thanks to Reverend uh, Kevin Quinn, the President of the University of Scranton, for the hospitality provided us for the conference, and also to my newest friend, uh, Dr. Stephen Scheinman, for his leadership at Pennsylvania's newest medical college, TCMC. We are very fortunate to have these capable leaders stewarding the mission and the operations of their respective institutions. I'd be remiss, of course, if I didn't acknowledge the other individuals <clears throat> who are really, along with Rebecca, <clears throat> the annual architects of this event, uh, of course, Dr. Brian. Uh, Conniff here, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and Dr. Herb Hauser. Now, Doc, notwithstanding your prior remarks, I, I do want to express our deep hope that your wife's healing will be quick. And, you know, in the legal world, they have a PFA. I think she might need a PFC, the pr protection from the canines. <laughs> but uh, we do want her, uh, her recovery to be swift. You've been able to build on early successes, and obviously this, this turnout and uh, this distinguished group uh, evidences um, you know, a great joint venture now between our two preeminent institutions in the University of Scranton and TCMC, but also, as Dr. Hauser mentioned, all the other institutions here that have contributed to the success of this event. So, ladies and gentlemen, aging is inevitable. As Robert Frost once said, the afternoon knows what the morning never suspected. So as we grow older, we grow wiser, or at least we ought to. The symposium, this symposium allows a proper application and sharing of wisdom to ensure a better quality of life for our seniors, and I'm grateful for all who are committed to this work. You know, just some quick facts and figures, and maybe you've heard some of this already during your conference sessions, or you may hear them again before you leave here, but I, I think it's important for me to just walk through some, some facts and figures. We have about 2 million <clears throat> citizens age 65 and older here in Pennsylvania. We rank fourth in the country in terms of residents over 85 years of age behind Florida, West Virginia, and Maine. One in five Pennsylvanians are 60 or more. That's almost three million people. We rank fourth in the U.S. by the number of percentage of individuals aged 85 and older, 300,000. And uh, these are obviously our most intensive users of nursing home care. 
By the year 2030, it is estimated that 3.6 million Pennsylvanians will be age 60 and older. Approximately 675,000 Pennsylvania's older adults have some form of disability. Many others suffer from chronic physical or behavioral conditions, and approximately 300,000 have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. In my Senate district alone, where we are now, there are nearly 44,000 residents over 65 years of age, which represents about 17 percent of the entire population of my district. Now more than ever, this growing senior population needs our help, and as lawmakers, our public policy judgments and our legislative activities involve the subject of this conference and are influenced by the following, obviously demographic realities, a growing, aging, and more diverse population. As was mentioned by Dr. Hauser, an adequacy of funding for our senior programs, and Secretary Duke does a mighty good job stewarding scarce resources for our seniors here in, Com in the Commonwealth. The adequate provision and regulation of long-term care facilities, including nursing homes, personal care homes, assisted living and residential care facilities, of course, housing issues associated with adequacy, affordability, and accessibility. Family and caregiver support, and I couldn't speak about this issue without just telling you personally what it was like some years ago as my mom uh, came into the later years, the latter uh, battle that she had with uh, lupus, and as her quality of life began to decline, dealing with uh, the challenges of the decisions and insurance and doctors and hospitals and uh, just very, very wrenching decisions that I know everyone in this room uh, is familiar with or will be soon. And my wife, Louise, uh, also went through uh, dealing with this with, with her parents and uh, most recently um, her, um, her cousin for whom she was the only uh, remaining family and caregiver. <clears throat> so these are issues that are close to home for all of us. Uh, obviously, health care costs, Medicaid in particular, as well as the interface of our insurance industry and our health care delivery systems, the basic daily needs of aging persons and particularly those with disabilities as relates to nutrition, the cost of food and living expenses, prescription drugs, mobility, and public transportation. Finally, economic indicators, the number of physicians and other skilled allied health care professionals, many of whom are in this, this audience, uh, upon whom our seniors and their families rely now and will be able to rely in the future. I, I wanted to speak about a few of these issues in a little more detail. On the cost of long-term care, according to the Pennsylvania Health Care Association, almost 70 percent of seniors who will turn 65 this year will require some form of long-term care. In Pennsylvania, the senior or their family can expect to pay $99,000 per year for a private room in a nursing home. The national average for a private room is about $81,000, so we're above the national average here in our region and here in our state. Intrinsically related to this financial reality is the Federal Affordable Care Act, and in particular the Medicaid expansion here in Pennsylvania. You're hearing an awful lot about this. There continues to be a complete transformation of our health care delivery system around this federal legislation, and it is still uh, an issue that uh, is undone in terms of the future of Pennsylvania on Medicaid expansion. And I will echo, and, and the Secretary I know will agree with me on this, I think that our governor is trying to negotiate a favorable entry of the Commonwealth and to try to deal with circumstances unique to Pennsylvania in the hopes that we obtain the flexibility we need to guarantee we don't make a decision uh, that is more costly to our taxpayers going forward. I have some urgency about the time, uh, but I do believe at the end of the day we'll get to the right place and hopefully uh, more quickly. Medicaid, of course, is the federal program that pays for 65 percent of the resident days of care that our Pennsylvania nursing homes have. Medicare, of course, takes care of another 13 percent. According to 2012 report prepared for the American Health Care Association, the cost to nursing homes to care for Medicaid patients exceeds their actual Medicaid reimbursements by about $26 per day, a 36 percent increase from the previous year's shortfall, which means that the state now underfunds nursing home care by an average of about $10,000 per Medicaid resident per year. So there are some serious issues out here in terms of scarce resources being deployed, federal or state, for the care that's being provided, and you have circumstances that force very, very difficult decisions about uh, among those providers in terms of the staffing that they can retain and the quality that they can ensure for the people for whom they care. Medicaid expansion in a recent RAND Corporation study indicated that it can add 2.2 to 2.5 billion in annual federal payments to Pennsylvania. RAND estimates this federal spending will generate between 3 and 3.6 billion in state economic activity, and this economic growth will support upwards of 35 to 40,000 jobs. That's, that's powerful information for a person like me sitting in the state Senate. But there are also hidden issues underneath that that are of deep concern to me as it relates to our business community and the expansion of health care insurance by small 
businesses, as well as the issue of our nonprofits who have providers and who have maybe over 50 employees who are deployed to provide home care to our seniors and who are deeply concerned about their bottom line as it relates to this transition uh, with the Affordable Care Act. We will be vigilant, and I know the Secretary as well as other members of the Governor's Cabinet will do the best we can, as I said, to guarantee that this transition has the highest quality and the best uh, cost prospects, if you will, uh, for Pennsylvania taxpayers. On the care, the delivery of care to the, elder, of the elderly, and I, I actually have I've talked about this a little bit as I considered the region, regional, uh, and actually I joined the Dean at his facility to announce a regional bioscience initiative that I think is intrinsically related, by the way, to what you're studying in aging because of this aging in place population and what research will tell us. But there's also the business side of this and, and what happens in terms of new technologies, innovations, and other learning that can inform uh, an industry to serve the needs of this growing aging population. But studies show that historically only one of every three physicians who completed their medical degree in Pennsylvania remained in this state to practice medicine. And we know, and I know the dean knows, that in rural Pennsylvania this, these issues are more pronounced. The state's population of licensed physicians stayed flat from 2000 to 2012, hovering at around 49,700. Uh, our population went up about 400,000. I've already mentioned the expanding proportion of, se of seniors who demand care. So it's a problem, and hopefully this university and TCMC will be addressing it going forward. Another issue of aging within a subset of aging has to do with physicians. Uh, the average age of physicians engaged in direct patient care in Pennsylvania in 2010 was 51. 0.5 years. The distribution of physicians across age groups reveals that 40 percent of physicians are in the 50 to 64 age group and 15 percent are in the 65 plus age group. So that's a, that's a pretty powerful piece of data when we are already dealing with the physician shortage. And that concerns me uh, quite a bit and I know it concerns the Dean and that's why we're very fortunate to have him stewarding the mission that will address hopefully that physician shortage and the change in that industry. Housing is another issue. You know, I began my public career in housing. It was uh, basically fixing up homes occupied primarily by fixed income people. I, I eventually got into removing architectural barriers um, using public dollars to guarantee accessibility for persons with disabilities. And so I have a real sense, I think, and I think the doctor alluded to this in my history about what it's like to deal with the people behind the numbers. I used to literally go into the attics and into the basements and get worried about heating systems that would shut down in the dead of winter or electrical systems that posed threats or architectural barriers and barriers to accessibility in terms of the lack of ramps and mobility and widened doorways and simple little things that we take for granted when we're 20 and 30 and 40 and maybe 50, but we won't take for granted when we're 70 or 80 plus. So I know a little bit about this because it's where I cut my teeth in public life and housing is a big issue uh, for our seniors. Um, we're basically a homeowner state, homeownership state. The state, that statement holds true regardless of the age of the householder. In fact, householders have a higher homeownership rate than younger households. But as you would expect, after you get past 65, the likelihood that that household is owner-occupied declines. The other issue that is paramount as it relates to our seniors is renting. renting. Uh, renters are likely to be cost burdened more so than owners. And the statement holds true regardless of the age of the householder. For the age group 75 to 84, 30% are severely burdened, 40% of renter-occupied households headed by persons uh, 85 years or old are severely burdened. You know, some of the debate about property taxation um, revolves around this issue. People unable, literally, to make decisions about prescription drugs that they need, unable to make decisions about buying oil or natural gas to heat their homes, unable to make decisions about whether or not they can pay their rent or their mortgage based upon the fact that um, they simply do not have the resources to meet, uh, meet it after they pay their taxes. I think this is a, a real issue that we need to contend, with which we need to contend as a legislature, and I promise that I will continue to be vigilant uh, to try to mitigate the uh, ill effects of what I think is an archaic uh, tax system. It, particularly, it is particularly difficult on our seniors, particularly difficult. As an elected official, I'm fully embedded in the responsibility I hold and serve in the best interest of all of my constituents, and I'm obviously deeply concerned that our seniors need and will continue to need more assistance than they are now able to avail themselves from both the federal and the state level. We will need to work toward innovative solutions that will allow the state to continue to adequately fund programs that are essential to meet our elder residents, and we need to find better efficiencies and more preventive actions that will mitigate the longer-term cost of living to our seniors and to our taxpayers generally. Right here, the University of Scranton and TCMC, as well as the other academic partners, have 
set the bar for research on aging issues. Those research efforts can inform the decisions we must make as policymakers. So it is my hope that as we continue to move forward out of these challenging economic times, we'll be able to provide the essential services and care not only to our seniors, but the members of their families who are often the key providers of that care. The data from good research is the key to ensure that we spend our scarce public dollars wisely. The conference provides a wonderful forum to share and exchange ideas on how best to serve our seniors and their families, and it could be a model for the nation. I look forward to hearing from Dr. Fried's keynote address. I'll offer another quote here uh, in closing. You know, Mark Twain said, when I was younger, I could remember anything, whether it happened or not. But my faculties are decaying now, and soon it shall be so that I cannot remember any but the things that never happened. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is a scary prospect, especially for someone in my line of work. <laughs> but uh, we best remember what's happening to our seniors. We must focus our attention on reliable empirical data in order to use what we know and what we learn to make things better for them and for their families. The mission of this conference is to engage our region's institutions and people like you in a greater understanding of the biological, behavioral, social, familial, and economic influences that our growing elder population will experience and will exert on society as a whole. I need your work to assist me in mine. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.